Today we are here to attend the talk by Mohit Mittal from Meta Platforms. So uh, Mohit holds the position of Senior Manager in Artificial Intelligence, Hardware at Meta Platform. At Meta, he leads a team of machine learning architects and hardware engineers focusing on the development of AI hardware accelerators for the AR and VR market. Prior to join Meta, Mohit serves at Microsoft as a Senior Hardware architect and technical lead, spearheading the development of AI training hardware solution for Microsoft Azure Cloud. With extensive work experience spanning over 18 years, he has occupied various senior technical leadership roles across startups and multinational corporations in both India and uh, the USA. He specializes in innovation and crafting cutting-edge technology in the field of semiconductors, AI, VR, cloud computing, and artificial intelligence. So, uh, Mohit, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and uh, the floor is uh, with you to start uh, your talk. Thank you, Professor Ricardo, uh, for the nice introduction and inviting me for this talk. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining from. My name is Mohit. The topic of my talk is AI hardware acceleration for AR VR devices. So AR VR, AI and hardware, they are very broad topics. In my talk, I'll go over what's AR VR, what role does AI play in, in AR VR experiences? What are the main use cases of AI? How do you develop a hardware for AI? And what are the main challenges? And eventually, how we can address some of them via hardware software co-design. With that, let's get started. I'm pretty certain that almost everyone here has at least some basic knowledge of AI and hardware, but I'm not sure if everyone understands what's AR and VR. So let's go, let's go over what's AR and VR. AR stands for augmented reality. It is a way to overlay digital images on what a person is seeing in the real world. An example of AR is this popular mobile game, Pokemon Go, which had over 1 billion downloads. In this game, the players explore the real world and find virtual plat Pokemons. Now, AR has many, many applications. For example, for shopping, there are apps available today that allow users to visualize furniture in their homes. They don't have to imagine like what, uh, so what color so far to put in their living room. Social media like Instagram has AR filters that change how a person looks like. There are apps on smartphones that can translate text in foreign languages. For example, if I come to Brazil, I don't know Portuguese, but I can use my phone to translate some of the Portuguese to English. So there are many, many examples of AR. The list of AR applications is growing with each passing day. Today, people use smartphones to run these applications. However, a lot of these applications are not able to achieve their full potential because of the underlying hardware. Imagine if I could see virtual images without taking smartphones out of my pocket. I'm sure it would create much, much better experience for everyone. That's where a lot of hardware companies are trying to build AR hardware or AR glasses and to bridge the gap in technology. The picture at the bottom is uh, is from AR uh, is the Rayban Meta Smart Glasses. It has camera, uh, it has voice assistants, speakers, and many other and, and few other things. It is not a complete AR product, but a first step towards it. Now let's look at what's VR. VR stands for virtual reality. VR is fundamentally very different from AR. In VR, the users cannot see their surroundings. Users wear these headsets and they see a very different world around them. It's like they're transferred to a very different world. Honestly, it's not that easy to describe how VR feels like. One has to try to feel the experience. But the good news is that there are some VR headsets out there in the market. Uh, the picture here is Meta Quest 3 VR headset. Now, how is VR used today? Number one is gaming. Gaming is very, very popular on VR. People take fitness classes on VR. 
one doesn't have to go to a gym to do yoga class health care education sports training and there are many other sectors that are seeing increased usage of vr so in the previous slide we looked at what's ar and vr now an obvious question comes to mind why is ar and vr important to understand more let's let's take a look at the progression of compute platform in the 20th century we had personal computers as our main compute platform pcs were used for everything for browsing for doing your office work playing games education and so on However, in the past 20 years, smartphones have slowly replaced personal computers as the main compute flat platform. A lot of stuff that we used to do on computers is done on phones nowadays. Almost everyone carries a smartphone with them all the time. Yes, we use phones to talk to people, but there is more to it. It is used to take pictures, listen to music, browse internet, and many, many other applications. Now, will it be same in the future? Probably not. That is where AR and VR comes in. AR and VR is often seen as the next compute platform. It may not complete your computers and smartphones, but it can certainly be the main compute platform that humans use in the future. However, there's a lot of work that has to be done to reach there. I see personal computers as the past, smartphones as the present, and AR VR as the future. So when I started working on AR a few years ago, I was not sure, sure if it's possible to build AR glasses. It was difficult for me to imagine how you can put so many sensors, batteries, hardware, silicon chips on a tiny pair of glasses. I'm sure many people here would have the same doubts. So here on the right, I have a picture of AR glasses that was built by Meta Platforms as part of a research project. It's called Project Aria. Today, it is used by over 4,000 researchers within Meta and outside to do the research on AR and enhance the future. For more information on these glasses and the project, you can go to projectaria.com website. Now, let's take a look at what, what's inside these glasses. On the right side, you can see there is a 8 megapixel RGB camera. There are two mono cam cameras on one on each side. There's a 2.5 watt hour battery. There is IMU, barometer, magnetometer, there's a Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, there are speakers, there are microphones, and many, many other sensors. To me, that's a lot of hardware. Packing all these components in a reg what looks like a regular glasses, it is certainly not easy. It's like a computer in a glass form factor. So far, we looked at what's AR and VR. Now let's talk about AI. Today, AI is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. It is emerging as the main force behind all the industries, healthcare, education, finance, manufacturing, automotive, you name it, AI is revolutionizing all of them. Surely, AR and VR is no different. In fact, it relies on AI even more than the other industries. So let's take a look at some of the major AI applications for AR VR. The first application I have here is hand tracking. Hand tracking, as the name suggests, is tracking your hand. Simple. But why do we need it? AR, VR are like computers on your face. You cannot connect keyboard, mouse, or touch screen to control the device. So how do you pass inputs to these devices? Luckily, hand tracking is a technology that can enable, nat enable natural interaction without the need of a physical controller. Hand tracking is enabled by AI models that tracks the continuous movement of your hands. A lot of smart applications can be built via hand tracking. You can have hand gestures that can be recognized and translated into commands. Using hands, users can move virtual objects around. They can perform pointing, uh, clicking, zooming, and swiping, etc. Next I have is eye, eye tracking. Eye tracking is another important application that is powered by AI. And now, eye tracking enables foveated rendering. Basically, it tracks the position of your eyes and the movement of the eyes and enhances the graphics only of the location where your eye is looking. This reduces computational load and enhances the performance. Next is the depth sensing. Depth sensing is used to measure the distance of objects. 
It enables accurate spatial understanding and, and is used in many, many applications. Speech recognition is very common on phones and smart home devices. On AR VR, it is no different. It enables hands-free control. Users can use uh, speech recognition to interact with the glasses. You can ask questions, take notes, or give commands to the glasses. Next is sensor enablement. We saw in the previous slide that there are plenty of sensors connected to these glasses. Now, most of the data coming out of these sensors need some sort of AI processing. That's, that's how it AI makes them meaningful. Now, there is a need to improve user experiences and that's what AI comes into picture. Next is image enhancement. Now, what's image, en what's image enhancement and what do, why do we need it? Typically, the cameras on these devices are very are of very small resolution. And in the upcoming slides, we will see why that's the case. But typically, small resolution means the image quality will not be good. So that's why AI is required to improve the quality of the images. The last application I have here is object detection, which basically it is to, to identify objects in the real world. Object de detection, again, enables many, many uh, user applications. So I have listed very uh, a few major AI applications. In reality, the list of AI applications that we need to support on AR VR is huge and it's growing every day. So, so far we looked at how AI is critical for AR VR devices. And the question is, where do we run these AI workloads? Now, do we run them on, a on cloud or we need to enable them on the glasses itself? Apparently, there are a few reasons that require AI workloads to run on the glasses. Number one is privacy. There are a lot of sensors that are connected to the devices, to the glasses that feed the AI applications. Camera, GPS, microphone, etc. carry a lot of private information that must be kept secure. For example, you may be taking a picture of your family members or browsing some confidential data. All this personal data must be kept secure. Moving this data to the cloud for AI processing could be a security risk. So we want to have some on-device AI for, for maintaining privacy. Next is latency. Latency is very critical to ensure smooth user experiences. It is obvious that anything you run on the glasses will have lower latency compared to if you're running something on the cloud. So it is, like I said, it is very, very critical to have latency sensitive applications. There are, there are games which are very latency sensitive. Even something like voice assistance, it is expected to have low latency. Next is connectivity. AI applications process large amount of data. Transferring large amount of data over internet needs good internet connectivity. Now, high, high bandwidth is not guaranteed everywhere. There are many places where the connectivity is not so good. For example, if you're going on a hike, you may not have good internet connectivity. That's why on-device AI is needed to tackle connectivity issues. Last but not the least is power. Power is very important for AR VR devices. The form factor of these devices do not allow us to put large batteries. In general, transmitting data to the cloud can burn more power than computing on device. To save power, these devices must be able to run AI workloads. We'll talk about power in the upcoming slides. In a nutshell, Privacy, latency, connectivity, and power are the four major factors that demand on-device AI capabilities. So in the previous slide, we talked about why we need to run AI workload on the glasses. Now let's look at some of the challenges. The single biggest challenge for running AI applications on the device is power. AI workloads are very compute heavy. The compute code typically has thousands of Macs. Uh, by the way, Mac stands for multiply and accumulate. When these Macs are in full operation, they burn a lot of power. When I say a lot of power, it's in the order of hundreds of milliwatts to a few watts. For glass form factor, that's a lot of power. So we also saw in the previous slides that, that there are multiple AI workloads that, to, that need to run on the glasses. 
So that needs a large battery to support these workloads. Now, we can't put large batteries on these devices. Batteries add a lot of weight and users don't want to wear heavy glasses. So not having enough energy source to feed all the AI workloads is a big challenge. Another related problem we have is the heat dissipation or TDP. TDP stands for thermal design point. Like I mentioned, AI burns a lot of power. However, these devices are thermally constrained. A typical smartphone has TDP of roughly 2 to 3 watts. However, if you look at the AR glasses, they have TDP of about 300 milliwatts only. So remember, you're wearing these glasses on the face. They must not get hot, otherwise nobody can wear them. In short, power is a big challenge that needs to be solved to build these devices. One need to, do a, one need to design an AI solution that is optimized for power. Now, apart from power, what are the other challenges that need to be addressed? Industrial design is another big problem. Remember, these, device, these devices are not big. There's not enough space to put large amount of hardware, sensors, or batteries. So that is one problem. The other problem is the size of the sensors. The quality of the sensor output depends on the size of the sensor. If you look at image sensors, like good DSLR cameras have uh, full frame sensors. Smartphones have relatively smaller sensors. The sensors on AR glasses is even smaller. Image quality from a small sensor is a problem. Thankfully, a lot of work in AI has been done to improve the quality of images. There are two types of problems that AI need to solve here. First is the image quality. We can improve image quality by using AI models like denoising. Also, there is no flash attached to the devices. So AI needs to improve AI, the low light imaging. The other problem we have is the resolution of the image. Given that we have small sensors, we need AI based solution to enhance the resolution of the image. Super resolution is a popular technique that is used in the world of AI to enhance the image resolution. A lot of work in the deep neural networks has been done in this field to enhance the resolution. But running models on super resolution is not that easy. And we will look at in the upcoming slides why that's a challenge. Another big challenge that AI hardware face is that there are multiple sensors connected to the device and there are, cam there are cameras that are tracking your hands and eyes and whatever you are seeing. There are microphones and other inputs to the glasses. Almost all of them need some sort of AI processing. So when we are building the AI hardware, we you know, almost all of, like I said, when we're building the AI hardware, we need to take into consideration how to handle all these multiple workloads. That is not an easy problem to solve. We can't simply put large amount of AI accelerators on the glasses. So far, we talked about what's AI, we talked about AI applications and some of the challenges that need to be addressed. Before we talk about AI hardware, let's look at what is a perceptron. Perceptron is a basic building block of a neural network. I assume most of the people have some familiarity with it, so I'll not go too deep into it. Essentially, a perceptron has four main components, input activations, weight, nonlinear activation function, and an output activation. A perceptron typically has, four, has lots of input activations. Sometimes it can grow to a few hundreds or even few thousands. Each input is associated with a different weight. So there is one weight per input activation. The perceptron computes the dot product of input activations and the weights, which is nothing but multiply accumulation unit. Then we add a fixed scalar to it called bias. Finally, it goes through a nonlinear activation function, which gives the output of the perceptron. ReLU, leaky ReLU, sigmoid are some of the popular examples of the nonlinear activation function. Now, which one gets used depends on the application. Like I mentioned, perceptron is the basic fundamental block for artificial neural network. A typical neural network is built by combining thousands and thousands of these in various forms. Now let's look at how does an AI hardware look like. Today, AI is one of the hottest topic in hardware industry. Before I talk about generic AI hardware, I do want to mention that there are many big and small companies 
that build hardware for AI. The, the hardware look very different depending on the application, whether you're building it for inference or training. Even for inference, there are various types of hardware accelerators uh, possible. So I will not go over the various hardware architectures, rather I'll focus on how does a typical AI hardware, inference hardware look like. When people talk about AI hardware, first thing to consider is the Mac engine. It is the heart of any AI accelerator. Mac stands for multiply accumulate. When designing the Mac engine, one needs to consider what data formats it has to support. There are multiple data formats that exist today. For example, floating point, single precision, half precision, there's a B float, there's fixed point, integer eight, integer 16, and so on. Next is how many Macs one need to use. Higher the number of Macs, higher the compute throughput. The other major compute block is the nonlinear activation function. Depending on the application, these blocks needs to be designed to support various nonlinear activation functions like ReLU, TANH, SWISH, Sigmoid, and so on. It may also need to support other operators like softmax, layer norm, batch norm, and so on. Both the MAC and the nonlinear activation functions, they are central to any AI hardware. Like I mentioned in the previous slide, a perceptron needs, it gets input activations, weights, and produce output activations. A ML model has a lot of, a lot of layers. There, there is local memory or, or typically SRAM that is connected to these compute, uh, these, these compute blocks. The MAC and the nonlinear activation blocks, they read weights and activations from this local memory, perform the computation and store the result back in the local memory. Another key component of the hardware is the DMA block. DMA stands for, stands for direct memory access. The job of the DMA block is to handle data movement uh, between this local memory and the external memory. Then there is a CPU or a DSP that handles the entire orchestration. It is essentially the brain of AI hardware. Various software layer stacks run on this CPU that are responsible for handling inference from start to finish. This includes programming the hardware blocks. Now, all these blocks are connected via network on chip, also known as NOC. Since there is a lot of data movement between these blocks, NOC design is very crucial or very critical in defining the performance of the hardware. I've seen a lot of times people put large amount of Macs or memories, but they don't design the NOCs properly, which result in underutilization of the hardware. Now, typically AI models are huge in the range of tens of MBs to hundreds of megabytes. The weights and parameters of these models can't be stored in a local memory. So these models are either stored in some sort of system cache or a DRAM. The NOC that connects the various hardware blocks in the AI hardware also connects to this DRAM and the cache. So that's how a typical AI hardware looks like. Now, in our, in our earlier slides, we talked about power as number one challenge for AR VR devices. If we have to optimize power, we need to know what are the biggest contributors for power consumption. A lot of people think that Mac engine burns all the power. Well, that is partially true. While Mac does burn significant amount of power, interestingly, in most of the application, Mac consumes less than 50% of the total inference energy. So if not Mac, what are the other sources of power consumption? The chart on the right shows the normalized energy cost of various operators in an AI accelerator. Let's divide this into two categories, compute and memory. When we talk about compute, we talk about Mac activation function, register file access, etc. Now, Mac is central to AI hardware. A single Mac consumes very, very small amount, small amount of energy compared to activation function like TANH or Sigmoid. However, we typically have a large amount of Macs compared to the activation functions. In total, I would say Mac and activation functions roughly take 50% of the total inference energy. Now, where is the rest of the energy coming from? The second com the component I listed here is memory, which is the source of the other source of energy. The local SRM attached to the compute has activations and, and weights 
that compute block operate on. AI models have large weights and activations that can't be stored in local SRAM. So they are typically stored in some sort of cache or DRAM. If you look at the chart, the energy you spend on reading one byte of DRAM is much, much higher than accessing some SRAM. Anytime there's a, there's a DRAM access, significant amount of power is consumed. So memory access is another major contributor to the power consumption. So far, we looked at power is a big challenge. Now, what can you do to optimize power consumption? There are a few ways how we can optimize power. Let's first look at ML model and architecture. So when we are developing ML model, we need to prioritize power. Typically, model developers use performance and accuracy uh, for neural architecture search. Since power plays a critical role in enabling AR VR devices, neural architecture search need to in include power also as one of the metrics. Second thing to consider is the precision of the data formats. Typically, ML use floating points as they give higher accuracy and are easy to train. Even though floating points are good for accuracy, they are not so good for power. So one need to ask this question, how much accuracy is good enough? Can it use fixed point representation to represent a model? One should try to go for as low precision as possible. Lower the precision, lower the power. Another thing that architecture can exploit is the weight sparsity. It turns out that ML models have a lot of weights as zeros. We know that multiplying by zero and adding zero to a number does not change its value. So we can leverage that property. Hardware can be architected in such a way that we exploit this weight sparsity to improve power efficiency. Another one is data reuse. We saw that fetching data from DRAM is power is expensive for power. We cannot avoid fetching data from DRAM, but what we can do, what we can do is reuse the data as much as possible. If you look at typical neural networks, there is a lot of reuse of activations and weight matrix. There are, there are various architectures that allow data reuse. One can use weight stationary, input stationary, or output stationary architectures to allow the reuse. So these were some of the architecture ideas for power optimization. On hardware implementation side also, multiple things can be done. One can create multiple voltage or power islands on the chip and turn them on only when needed. This helps in saving leakage power. This is not a new concept for a chip design. However, when designing AI hardware, one can go very aggressive in using in defining how many power domains they want. Now, dynamic power is a huge component of total power. Clock gating is a technique that is used in chip development to save dynamic power. For AI hardware, again, one can go very aggressive while doing dynamic clock gating. One can implement multiple levels of clock gating to save dynamic power. On top of talk, uh, clock gating, there are techniques like data gating that can be used to prevent unnecessary toggles and save glitch power. Physical design is another major lever that can be used to optimize power. In the past, timing and area were the major knobs that physical design tools used to use to optimize the design. However, however the EDA tools today, they have become much better at, at doing power aware physical design. Now, PDA tools, they can be enabled to look at switching activity of the design to optimize the power. Also, they can use multi-bit flip-flops wherever possible that reduces area as well as power. There are other techniques like dynamic voltage frequency, frequency scaling that can be used to save power. In short, hardware and software has to be co-designed to optimize the power. Now, machine learning accelerators have limited on-chip memory, and that's a big challenge that almost all the accelerators face. Let's take a look at one of the example networks. Earlier, we talked about super resolution web network that is used to enhance the image resolution. Here, we have a table that shows per layer activation memory footprint of a super resolution network that takes 1024 by 1024 input and gives 2048 by 2048 output image. There are roughly 50 layers in this model. 
The memory needs to store three types of activations. One is the input activations of a layer that is shown in blue here. The other is the output activation that is shown in red. And the third is the skip or the residual connections that is shown in green. If you look at the chart, most of the layers, the memory requirement for them is between 50 to 100 megabytes. Now, any typical ML hardware that is designed for AR VR application has much smaller internal memory. For anything that cannot fit in the local memory, the data has to be spilled to the external memory. Now, why that is a problem? Let's take a look at the memory hierarchy in, hierarchy in a typical SOC. Local SRAM connected to the compute block is small in size. Typically, it's in the range of quarter of megabytes to eight megabytes. Now, local SRAM has very low energy, typically in the range of 0.1 picojoules per byte to one picojoules per byte. It also allows high bandwidth for accesses. The next level is the in the memory hierarchy is the system cache, which is a shared memory between various IPs on the chip. This memory is slightly larger in size typically in the range of four megabytes to 32 megabytes, but it has slightly higher cost in terms of picojoules per byte. The access to this memory goes through a knock. Given the cost of routing wires on the chip, the typical bandwidth of accessing this memory is slightly lower than the local memory bandwidth. The last level in the memory hierarchy is the DRAM. DRAM is typically gigabytes in size. Large memory storage is good for ML models, However, the energy spent on accessing these DRAMs is in the order of hundreds of picojoules per byte, which is much higher than accessing local memory. So we want to optimize for power. We need to limit the amount of activation spills to the DRAM. Now, how do we do that? Let's take a look at a few possible solutions. For, reading, for reducing activation spilling, first thing we can do is use structured activation sparsity, also known as pruning. Basically, what we do is we remove some of the nodes in the model. This is done by forcing some of the activations to zero. This is typically done while training the model. Now, higher the amount of sparsity, lesser data will be spilled to the DRAM. The downside of too much of sparsity is the accuracy loss. So the right amount of sparsity needs to be enabled while training the ML model. The hardware can also be architected to leverage sparsity. At the output of the activation function, a compression block can be added that compresses the data and stores the compressed data in the DRAM. While ML accelerator needs to access this data, it can be decompressed before it goes to the compute block. Another way to solve activation spilling problem is subtiling of data. Instead of processing the entire image, we can tile the image into subtiles and process these subtiles independently. Typically, convolutional, convolutional neural networks, they need some overlap for the tiled region. That, that overlap increases the amount of compute and memory requirement. However, we can reduce this tiling tiling overlap via a better network design. This would need refining the models and sometimes even using multiple models to remove the imperfections. Earlier in the presentation, we looked at various types of AI workloads. Now these workloads are heterogeneous in nature and are very different and have unique requirements. For example, if you look at the hand tracking applications, it involves continuous tracking of a hand. Now, hand tracking is a real-time workload. It needs to be completed in a given amount of time. It also has a high frame per second requirement. Typically, that would be 30 to 90 frames per second, depending on the application. Even something like scene tracking is a real-time workload, but compared to hand tracking, it has slightly lower frame per second requirement. Image processing is typically high compute workload and is bursty, is bursty in nature. They typically do not have any stringent timing requirements. Now, how do we build a solution that can serve such heterogeneous nature of workloads? If we, if we could afford multiple large chips, yes, we could add multiple AI accelerators to support all these parallel applications. 
but we cannot do that because of the id constraints now if we cannot put multiple ai accelerators what can we do so let's take a look at couple of ideas in the next slide apparently to tackle the heterogeneous nature of ai workloads we need the help from both hardware and software software implements a runtime scheduler to schedule various ai workloads on the hardware accelerator now given the heterogeneous nature of ai workloads the scheduler needs to be very intelligent it needs to understand the priority of the workloads the latency requirements and the hardware capabilities smart scheduling decisions have to be made when AI, when multiple ai workloads are active for example it may be okay to delay low priority workload like image denoising in favor of serving high priority workloads like hand tracking which has a which has a real time high frame per second requirement another way to reduce or solve the problem is to build a low overhead context switching solution which can seamlessly switch between low priority and high priority workloads a typical neural network has multiple layers the concept behind uh, context switching is that if you are executing a low priority workload and while executing the low priority workload a high priority inference request comes the hardware pauses executing the low priority workload the hardware and the software states are stored and then it switches to the high priority workload once the high priority workload is executed the context of the low priority workload are resumed or restored and then the low priority inference is allowed to resume for example if you look in the bottom figure we have a low priority workload a running after running two layers of that low of the low priority workload a high priority workload inference request comes the software pauses the inference a and saves the context one thing to note here is that the hardware must be designed in a way such that when we are saving the context it has a very low overhead now after saving the context workload b is run when when, when workload b is done the context of workload a is restored and is allowed to resume the operation again the hardware must be designed for low overhead during context switching so a smart runtime scheduler along with low overhead context switching solution can help with efficient handling of heterogeneous ai workloads so whenever we are designing the hardware we have to optimize for ppa ppa stands for power performance and area typically you cannot optimize all three of them at the same time for example if you are optimizing for higher performance you may put for more you may put more max or have larger memories in a hardware but that would increase both area and power so one need to find the right balance based on the use case like if when you are looking at the numerics you have to look at should we put more floating point or integer fixed or integer numerics or custom numerics similarly the right amount of uh, the right balance of compute of memory has to be put in the hardware thorough analysis has to be done should we put more compute on the chip or more memory on the chip that comes that is actually dependent on the applications you are running so when the both hardware and the software architect architects have to sit together to come up with the right solution use all the low power design techniques whatever you can use to optimize for ppa use algorithms like compression and sparsity wherever possible to optimize for ppa there is a lot physical design can help with optimizing ppa we talked about some of the techniques in the in the previous slides now even architecture we can also do architecture aware physical design basically when you building the architecture architects can work with physical design engineers to see how they can optimize the ppa when looking at the architecture so in the presentation today we looked at various challenges that ai accelerator face on ar vr devices we talked about challenges related to the memories heterogeneous workloads and so on to solve these problems we cannot focus on just software and hardware the key idea we discussed today is that hardware and software must be co-designed software it dictates the accuracy of the model but while designing the model we also need to consider what kind of data formats hardware need to support and not to over design the hardware 
Similarly, user experience is very important and both hardware and software, they need to be aligned on that. Tasks like context switching, they need adequate support from both hardware and software. System resources and energy efficiency need to be considered while designing the models and software. Algorithms and, algorithms and architecture need to be aware of the hardware constraints. Software and hardware needs to be co-designed to optimize the power, performance, and area. So that was the last slide of my presentation. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Sorry, <laughs> there was a little issue here to put my screen again back. Oh, no problem. So, uh, thank you very much, Mohit, for the nice uh, talk. So uh, I see two questions here in the in the chat. So one is from Shadi Agwa. So uh, Shadi is uh, from Edinburgh, UK. So what about the energy consumption breakdown, which affects the battery? Yeah, that's a very good question. Now, it is difficult to answer what is the energy breakdown, which affects the battery. You have to look at the applications you are running. Both AR and VR are slightly different in terms of what models run there, what kind of applications run there, and what a kind of battery you can have. Typically, VR is much bigger in size compared to AR, so you can afford to put a larger battery on VR compared to AR. A lot of time people think it's the power which matters, but it's the energy, right? Sometimes you want to run things slowly and that can optimize the overall energy consumption. So you look at the compute, the AI accelerators have to do, there's a display which burns a lot of power, right? And if you see the display, the any hardware acceleration, that is the main source of energy consumption. Okay, thank you. So we have another question by Pubu Elon Correa da Silva. So um, Pubu is from uh, University of São Carlos uh, at São Paulo. So how to ensure that heavier workloads such as image processing won't cause a FPS drop when considering the overhead time? Yeah, again, a good question. So image processing, so there are, yes, it needs a lot of compute. But the good thing is there are applications which need some sort of FPS and some applications don't need a high FPS. If you're looking at applications, let's say you're displaying something on the glasses, yes, it needs good FPS and we have to make sure that there is no FPS drop. In that case, the accelerators that are designed, they are designed in a way that there will not be any FPS drop. Remember that like user experience is very, very important. If you are not able to see things clearly, users will not use those devices or the glasses. So you build custom hardware which tackles these high FPS requirements for the image processing applications. Thank you. So I see no more questions in the chat channel. If you have a question, please do it quickly. Uh, but I have one. Uh, when you talk about power optimization, you, you are also considering um, uh, physical design optimization like uh, optimization of the transistor count uh, and uh, to reduce uh, logic? Yes. So physical design, typically it can, you know, when we look at physical design, it's a very, I, I see that as a very strong tool in optimizing PPA. Uh, there are many, many techniques when, when using physical design tools to optimize for area and power. Like what kind of a, you know, VT cells that has to be used? Should we use low VT cells or high VT cells? 
right? What kind of a drive strength cells we have to use. And we done a lot of experiments. We do a frequency voltage sweep, right? And to find that optimal point, which is which is used for, uh, you know, what is the right point for optimizing for the performance and the area. Like I said, area on the glass is, is not free. It is very, very expensive resource. So you have to optimize the area, like make sure the utilization of the core is very high. Like typically 70 to 80% of utilization is seen as a good number, but that's not easy. You have to place the cells very close to each other. But the other problem with that is like when you place cells close to each other, the IR drop of the you know cells, they increase. Now, given the battery constraints and the packaging constraints, you cannot afford these high IR drops. So what techniques people use? Again, people use various techniques to handle those IR drops. Some are physical design techniques, some are, some are architecture techniques. But the gist is that both physical, the physical design engineers have to work with the architects and they need to come up with a good solution which works together to optimize the both you know, area and power. So you are, are you using standard cells for the physical design? Yes, we use standard cells uh, for physical design. Some cells we do build by ourselves, customize, because we know that some cells are depending on the use of them. We do customize a bit, but typically standard cells we use. Yeah, because uh, we we are working here on a alternative solution that is to not using standard cells because normally the library, they don't have it, so many functions. No? And then we you have to synthesize automatically any any function, and then to use more uh, complex gates in order to reduce the amount of transistor. But uh, this is a longer discussion. So I have uh, some other other uh, questions here. So another one from Shady Agua. Do you think any momentum for adopting emerging? Technology and architecture like memory or crossbar and in memory computing? Yes, there are a lot of new uh, emerging technologies that look very promising. Like in memory computing, we talked about, or even, you know, memory, memory resistor crossbars. They are very powerful. They look pro promising. But again, they're still not productized yet. It will take a few years before they become popular. And I will not be surprised that we see more and more of, you know, in-memory computing and many other technologies like 3D stacking and others, which are getting used in AR and VR applications. Okay, thank you. We have also a question here by Professor Altamiro Suzin from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Thanks for the nice presentation. The optimization proposal will focus a single application hardware or a general purpose inference machine? Uh, I would say it's more like a general purpose uh, inference accelerator. Like when you say again, general purpose, surely you have to look at what you are trying to solve. Like I said, in there are a lot of AI applications. Like do you have hardware sitting in the cloud? in your phones, in the small, you know, like AR, VR devices, they are, they have very different problems to solve. Now, some optimize for area, like, and some optimize for power. Uh, area for cloud is not a big problem, but area for uh, AR, VR is a big problem, right? So you have to look at what are the applications you are running and what are the problems in those applications and have to optimize the hardware for that. The most of the concepts See the stay the same. Like like I said, we talked about PPA optimizations. Yes, everyone has to optimize PPA. But which one you optimize more compared to others, that depends on the application. Thank you. So uh, I have another question by Guilherme Corol. Uh, what about reducing memory costs with another architectures instead of Mac arrays? Data flow can reduce your reads for loading weight. For AR, VR, do you see MAC arrays being replaced? Thanks. Yeah, that's an active area of research. And I know a lot of universities are doing research in that field. Even at Meta, we are doing a lot of research. 
in the same lines. Uh, I don't see them getting replaced today. Uh, I know it will happen in the future, but not today. And the reason is AI is changing very fast. The applications are changing very fast. You cannot, you have to be very generic when you're building a hardware because whatever AI applications or algorithms we see today, they will be very different next year and the year after that. So you have to be a bit generic. And then having these Mac arrays, it which basically do this load, you know, loading of weights, activations, right? They, that is pretty generic. Eventually, things will be, you know, the algorithms will stabilize. And then that's where we, people will look at, can they harden some of the weights? Can they not use Macs or use uh, something else? Yes, that will happen in the future. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, another question by Professor Suzin. Low precision arithmetic is frequently proposed to reduce power. Do you see the possibility to have a multiple precision in a machine? Yes, low precision is very, very important for any on-device AI hardware accelerator, right? Like Professor rightly mentioned, yes, it is directly proportional to reducing the power. In fact, floating point is very, very expensive. It's a crime to use floating point uh, arithmetic in on AR, VR devices. Now, can we use multiple precisions in the device? I would say yes and no, depending on the applications again. If you support multiple precision formats, yes, you're adding more flexibility, but you're also adding more area and you're not optimizing for power, right? So one has to look at uh, what are the applications. And like I talked about hardware, software, code design. When you're building the hardware, you have to look at the software and the models, right? You have to train your models in a way that they can be optimized for that precision. Uh, that's the best part about uh, you know AI. You can, a model that was trained in floating point that can be easily mapped to fixed point like int 8 or int 16. So I would say both hardware and software engineers have to work together to pick one format maybe two, but not a lot of them because that's not good for PPA. Okay, thank you very much. I see no more questions now in the chat. So thank you very much, Mohit, for the very nice talk. Mm -hmm.